session in interviewing eminent scientists. I am Kasunti Saran. And I am Ashwini Ramana. We are fourth year undergraduates from Department of Chemistry, University of Colombo, and we will be your host for today. Today, we have with us here a spectacular scientist who is working toward making the energy industry carbon free and the world more sustainable. We take great pleasure in welcoming Professor James Darren, a professor of photochemistry in the Faculty of Natural Sciences at the Imperial College London and Say Kaimri Solar Professor at Swansea University. He is the director of Imperial Center for Processable Electronics and founding director of UK Solar Pearls Network. He's a fellow of Royal Society and the Learned Society of Wales and is a recipient of many prestigious awards. A very good morning, Professor Dylant. Oh, that was very daunting. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. And good, morning, and good morning, Professor Darren. I must say, it's an honor to have you here with us today. I'm very pleased to be here to talk to you. Yeah. And Professor, before we begin, would you mind giving us a brief introduction about you, your early education, and what led you to choose a path of science? I went to school in Norfolk, which is my home county, quite a rural area. and. I, my father was a lawyer and I was going to be a lawyer um, and, and follow his footsteps, but I found I much preferred maths than physics to, to uh, and actually I, I wasn't so keen on chemistry at the time, but I, I, I like my maths and my physics. Um, and I decided to stick with that path. I, I, I remember I, I wanted to do something useful in the world and um, I wanted about being a doctor, because I, um, but, but but this was the 80s and I was just, we were just starting to get worried about overpopulation and I was young and healthy and I thought, oh, the world doesn't need doctors because I'm young and healthy and I'm not going to get ill and so they, they, that's not so important. But what was, was more important was the, the, the effects of the environment of the large population. And, and, um, and I, I chose, when I was about 18, to want to work on solar energy. Of course, that, that logic is always um, very naive, and now I rather see the point of doctors as my body gets older. But, but um, at, at the time, I, I committed myself to trying to find a way to work in solar energy, and that's been my ambition and driving force ever since. And Professor, could you brief us on the current research you're working on? So. I've always had a challenge, but I would like to be doing something useful in terms of developing um, technologies to harness solar energy. But my research passions and skills are not very useful in the sense that I like to measure electron transfer kinetics. Um, I'm relatively, relatively uh, a fundamental scientist, and so I, I like to try to understand why one material works differently than another material in terms of converting sunlight. And so the research in my group is focused on evaluating new materials which may become tomorrow's technology. Um, focus particularly on solar energy conversion. And I'm very fortunate to work with many other colleagues who are maybe more useful at actually turning those materials into something practical. Um, in particular, that's why I have this joint position with Swansea University, where they have a particular focus on turning the science into application. So my group is primarily a spectroscopy group. We have um, five or six laser systems and we, 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 we measure kinetics in um, following the absorption of the photon um, in a whole range of materials and devices which are interesting for solar energy conversion. Um, the materials we study has evolved as the science globally has evolved. Um, I, I, the first major program I, I led was on disensitized solar cells. Um, now our focus in solar cells is more on the organic solar cells and some work on muscite solar cells. And 
increasingly the work in my group is also focused on the area of what's called artificial photosynthesis. Um, and um, hires in sunlight to make fuel, which I've quite enjoyed particularly because it's, um, it's like going full circle back to my PhD. Um, I, I didn't talk about my undergraduate studies. I studied um, natural sciences and physics at Cambridge and then um, went on. So, so I got, I, I got a, a, an undergraduate degree in physics and then I moved to the Department of Biology at Imperial um, to study plant photosynthesis. Um, and I got a PhD at, in the end in biochemistry. Um, officially, though in practice my PhD involved building, building lasers and so there wasn't so much biochemistry really involved, apart from us trying to understand the photosynthetic systems. But it's, it's quite, it's very nice for me that, I, that um, I've kind of gone full circle, that I, I started off in photosynthesis, I then jumped over to solar cells and now I've come back to artificial photosynthesis. Uh, Professor, like you mentioned, uh, your work is largely based on solar cells and uh, the solar cells, the concept of solar cells has been there for nearly half a century and the world has seen many different types of solar cells. So like you mentioned, what has been the evolution of these photovoltaic cells? Like how far have we progressed in terms of cost efficiency design? And also what can we expect to see in the near future? The last 50 years has seen something like a hundredfold drop in the cost of solar cells. And most of that has been driven, uh, it's been driven partly by increases in efficiency, but it's mainly been driven by reductions in manufacturing cost. Economies of scale and innovation in how to make those devices cheaper. Uh, and of course, that is been almost entirely based around silicon solar cells. And Silicon solar cells now operate at near the thermodynamic limits of efficiency. Um, you, you can make more complex multi-junction cells which are more efficient, but they get much more expensive. They're really only useful for satellites or for when you have lots of mirrors shining um, onto one solar cell. But silicon solar cells are already a remarkably um, cheap efficient and stable technology. Um, and that of course is driving the explosion in um, solar energy conversion and photovoltaics globally. Um, and um, I'm wonderfully excited by that. But actually silicon is a rather strange material to use as a solar cell, for solar cells. Um, from, from a, a physical chemistry viewpoint, it's an indirect band gap semiconductor. Um, which means that it's actually not a very good light absorber. Um, so you actually need quite a thick layer of silicon to absorb enough photons to make it black and to absorb all, all the light. Um, and that's why um, if you find the silicon solar cell, it's, it's nearly always um, a, a crystalline wafer of silicon sandwiched between two pieces of glass because it's quite thick and fragile and you can't bend it and you can't flex it and all this sort of thing. And it, so you have to, it, it's quite delicate and you have to protect it by two plates of glass to stop it being bent or broken or whatever else. Um, there's a whole raft of what are often called thin film solar cell technologies coming um, on stream now, um, which are distinct from silicon and then silicon you take a big lump of silicon crystal and you slice it up into your ingots and thin film you take a substrate and it can be um, some conductive coating on a glass or it can be a plastic film with a conductive coating on and you you deposit the material directly onto the substrate as a thin film um, and this in principle it, it um, allows you to make devices which um, because the, the layers now are much thinner, because the materials used are much stronger light absorbers than silicon. And so they're more bendable because they're not so fragile. Um, you can imagine putting onto flexible substrates. Um, you can imagine because you no longer need two plates of glass, the device can be much lighter. And these properties allow you to think about making solar cells which 
are not going to be more efficient than silicon, but allow you to go to market applications where trying to um, have a heavy solar cell stuff with two plates of glass is not very attractive or, or useful. Um, I'm particularly interested in organic and phosphate solar cells for this purpose. Other people are just other materials. Um, and I particularly like the idea that we can process these materials at near room temperature so that the um, energy cost of device fabrication is low. Um, the energy cost of making sil a silicon solar cell is much, much higher. And what I hope is that this is going to enable us to um, design and manufacture devices which are not necessarily going to be um, more, more efficient. They're, they're, they're starting to get deficiencies almost the same as silicon. Um, Phosphites already are the same as silicon. Um, organics are catching up. Um, Cadmium telluride is catching up. But they will be different to silicon in how they can be used in the market. And so um, my colleagues in Swansea are looking at the potential for laminating solar cells onto steel roofing. Um, so that you can have relatively lightweight buildings um, covered by steel roofing. I, I don't know, in Sri Lanka, in the UK now, we've got steel warehouses going up all over the country um, with, with Amazon and all this sort of thing. But you can't put silicon solar cells on the warehouses because the solar cells are too heavy uh, and, and the warehouses aren't strong enough to hold them up. But if you could laminate solar cells as a foil onto that steel roofing, all the warehouses could be covered in solar cells with very little extra cost. Um, and or we're, we're interested in, well, there's lots of excitement now about the Internet of Things and how we're going to have sensors all over our houses. Um, but silicon solar cells work really badly indoors, whilst um, these organic and phosphate cells in particular work very well indoors. Uh, obviously, not so much power as under full sun, but their efficiency is actually higher than silicon indoors. And so what I think we're going to find is that silicon is still going to be a fantastic technology um, for many applications out, out in the desert or wherever it may be. But I think we'll find as the world becomes increasingly powered by solar, a greater diversity of what a solar cell looks like and how it can be um, employed in the market. I hope that helps. So Professor, so that's a very interesting, like how there are different types of solar cells that's coming up and all. Like, however, like even now we have not achieved the theoretical efficiency, if I'm right, which is around 33.7%. Well, it's, it's not far off. So, um, for, for, for a single junction cell, so you can make more complicated cells with tandems and all this, but with a single junction cell, there's the shock requisal limit, which um, depends upon the band gap of the material. And I think silicon's now at about 25 or 26%. And I think the optimum efficiency is about 28%, which is, which is, and so it's almost at the theoretical maximum. Um, gallium arsenide is even closer to the theoretical maximum, but it's too expensive. Um, Proskites are not yet at the theoretical maximum, but they're, again, they, they, they're not far off. Um, the organics are catching up. Um, so obviously you, you want to get reasonably close to the theoretical maximum in order to get the most power out, but that, that, there are quite a few technologies now we're achieving that. The, the challenge is to have a device which is uh, where when you put it into the market and you try and sell a system, the overall system is cheap. Uh, and um, I didn't really talk about it, but, but um, it used to be that when you put up silicon solar cells on your roof, the main cost is a solar cell. Now the main cost is putting it up. Um, and that's, that's, and that's, it's expensive to put it up because it's two plates of glass. If we could change how it was encapsulated, um, even if the technology itself was more expensive, the system would become cheaper or could become cheaper. And Professor, uh, will, we, will we be able to see cheap printable solar cells taking over the market anytime soon? Well, to some extent, you, you already can see. Um, there's now increasing parts of the world where if you want to install new power generation, the cheapest way to do that is solar cells. So I forget a bit, I, I, if I quote numbers, I'm going to get in a muddle, but it was, um, but 
two or three cents per kilowatt hour, something like that. The, 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 um, in, in the recent auctions, for example, in Portugal or in um, Saudi Arabia, um, the cost which people were committing to, to sell solar powered electricity at um, was a markedly low and was cheaper than coal without any subsidy. Um, and so, at least in the sunny parts of the world, um, if you have a reasonable amount of land that is not too expensive, then solar is already the cheapest technology. Uh, there's issues of storage and intermittency and how the grid handles all that. But in terms of power generation, I think, um, uh, uh, and of course we need to find ways to bring down the cost in less sunny places and understanding how in, for example, Western Europe, you can put up solar cells without, um, in cities rather than in fields. So you don't take up um, land, but you integrate the solar cells into the built environment. Um, these all advances all need to happen. But I think in many areas now, if, if, if the, the march of solar is now unstoppable in the sense that economics is going to drive it. Professor, uh, just another quick question, like since you mentioned about the space problem, uh, wh what about the floating solar cells? Like, is that a good solution? Like, I'm, I'm sorry, what, what, what solar cells are? Floating solar cells? Ah. Like, I mean, they have implemented it, but is that a viable solution for the space problem? So there are already some examples of floating solar farms. I, I'm aware of those particularly in Brazil. Um, it's probably not the easiest way because the problem is that solar cells are very large areas and having to put up barges or whatever to float the solar cells on. Um, you, you'll need to have environments where the, there's not too significant waves. Um, wind turbines work can work well in stormy waters because they're well above the water, um, but solar cells can't because I, I think they're, they're such a, an insulation that just be destroyed by the waves. So, I, I, of course, there will be some applications, most obviously in lakes, where it's interesting to put on solar cells, but I, I doubt it's going to be a major example of application. I think you have a question. Yeah, uh, Professor, uh, could you give us a brief insight about the advantages of using non polarine organic solar cells? Ah. So, organic solar cells were um, really took off um, in the mid 90s, from the mid 90s, when people worked out they could um, deposit a um, solution containing a donor polymer and a soluble fluorine um, um, and essentially um, spread that on a surface allow it to dry and it would phase segregate into what was called the bulkhead production. So a, a mixture of donor and acceptor um, where the, the fluorine took the electron and the polymer took the hole and the polymer absorbed the light and um, the, the beauty of fluorines are that because they're um, round balls um, they, they pack quite well and they're quite isotropic in their transport. Um, and um, because they're quite rigid, they, they, because it's a, it's a fixed ball, they don't deform when you put a charge on it, which allows electrons to move more easily. Um, and so for 15 years, everyone based their organic solar cells around developing new polymers to go with the fluorine. But the problem with that is that the fluorine um, whilst it's a wonderful material, it's not that tunable. But it, it's, it's, a, um, it's a C60 ball or a C70 ball, um, and you can tweak the edges, but you can't do much else. Um, and then about, the, 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 in parallel, um, many people have been trying to make alternatives to fluorine. And until about four years ago, no one had ever found an acceptor which would perform better than following in a solar cell. Um, and the efficiencies of the organic solar cells was kind of stuck and plateaued with around about 12% and wasn't improving. And people were starting to lose interest in the organic solar cells. 
because of the, the, of the concern they were never going to get efficient enough to be really useful. But then about four years ago, um, several key groups, um, some groups um, in, in China and Hong Kong, and also one of my colleagues from Imperial, I mean, the Hello, um, demonstrated non fulluent acceptance. And non fulluent is a bit of a silly word, it's a negative word, it doesn't mean anything that isn't a fulluent. Um, but, but essentially, they were able to start designing more planar rather than ball shaped organic molecules, which could outperform fulluent in organic cell result. And that has kind of unlocked um, our ability to tune both the donor and the acceptor in these cell cells, um, which has enabled us to optimize both components separately. And that is unlocked quite unexpected and remarkable advances in efficiency of these devices. And so they've gone up from about, but they were stuck at about 12% for a few years, um, and then they've now jumped up to 18%. And um, the, the trajectory is still going steeply upwards. Um, I don't think four years ago anyone would have predicted that. Um, and, but it's very exciting because it's suggesting that um, the organic cell cells are going to start to have efficiencies which maybe won't quite catch up the silicon, but may, but may not be so far behind. Is that, uh, of course, turning those efficiency advances in the small lab scale camping cells into a technology um, is not trivial. And um, to, to, get, to get something which is going to be really useful, you don't just need efficiency, you need stability, you need cost, you need processability and all this sort of thing. Um, those are all challenges which haven't yet been fully resolved with these new new organic cell results. So, Professor, another interesting uh, topic that you're working on is artificial photosynthesis as a potential mechanism uh, for using uh, solar force. So, mm. what really sparked your interest in artificial photosynthesis? And could you also briefly explain about artificial photosynthesis and its importance? There's two reasons why I find it inspired. One more inspiring, one scientific, and one more personal. Um, so artificial photosynthesis is based upon the idea that plants already use sunlight to um, make chemical bonds, to, to synthesize um, biomolecules, most obviously glucose, um, using sunlight as the energy resource. And the, the light is, is shone on the photosystems absorbed by the chlorophylls, which drives electron transfer events which separate charge, and then separated charges drive catalysis. Um, and in particular, they oxidize water to molecular oxygen, um, and then they go on to um, reduce NADP to NADPH, and ultimately to, um, to power the, the reduction of CO2 to sugars. And Whilst we know that um, if you measure the efficiency of plant photosynthesis at the level of a plant, then often it's not that efficient. Um, of course, um, there are examples of things like sugarcane in Brazil, which can be a few percent efficient. So um, still five to 10 times less than silicon solar cell, but not bad. But um, most biological photosynthesis is much less than 1% efficient. Um, and this of course is because plants didn't evolve primarily to make energy. They, they evolved to live, and, and living's quite complicated, um, as we all know, and plants also experience. Um, but if you go down to a molecular scale, then you find that the efficiency of the processes which the plants use to convert sunlight to um, NADPH or to fuel are actually rather efficient. Um, and at efficiency levels, which are comparable to a silicon solar cell. And that is quite exciting and inspiring because it, it suggests that um, it's possible to convert sunlight to chemicals at um, efficiencies which would be useful as a technology. And um, we're also well aware that there's increasing interest in bioenergy and biomass, but aware that globally, um, for that increasing interest is starting to compete with food production on, on arable land. And so the interest is um, 
can we develop artificial systems which can um, harness sunlight to make a fuel, um, which don't compete with biological land for food production. And this also links with the, the idea of um, sustainable fuels and chemicals. Of course, fossil fuels came from sunlight um, um, being used to, to um, uh, convert CO2 into, into sugars many years ago. Um, we want to do the same thing, but artificially, um, so that we can make, um, we can synthesize fuels for the chemical feedstocks for the chemical industry. And um, of course, the simplest fuel to make is hydrogen and water splitting. And there was a wonderful paper by Fukushima and Honda in the 70s, which showed that it's possible to shine light on titania um, and split water into hydrogen and oxygen. Um, over the last 10 years, so research in this area of artificial photosynthesis was very active in the 70s and 80s, um, inspired by Fukushima and Honda. And then oil prices crashed and everyone stopped being interested in, in, in artificial photosynthesis, or most people didn't, the Japanese kept on going, um, until people started to get seriously concerned about global warming, um, and sometimes about the, the um, peak oil, but mainly global warming. Um, and that has reinvigorated interest in um, trying to find solar-driven pathways to fuel. Um, one pathway, of course, is to combine photovoltaics and electrolyzers, and that's a very interesting pathway. Um, another pathway is to try to use sunlight directly to drive the chemical reactions as possible. And so now there are many, many groups around the world um, and many very large programs um, trying to look at the scientific and engineering challenges of how to harness sunlight to synthesize this fuel. Um, from my own perspective, I found it rather a wonderful field to work in, apart from it being useful or, 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 or potentially useful, but it's a field which is dominated by material scientists and synthetic chemists making materials. Um, and there are rather few groups working on the spectroscopy of how those materials actually function. And so I saw an opportunity for my group to focus on the spectroscopy of how those materials function. And um, that, is, that, that, that has been something which we found very um, rewarding and exciting over the last few years. Does that answer your question? Yes, Professor, yes. Yes, and it sounds very interesting. So, Professor, just expanding on that question, um, like, could you uh, let, tell, let us know, like, uh, how, uh, like, what are the challenges that we need to overcome in order to produce molecular fuels like a hydrogen at a scale and cost that can compete with fossil fuels? Well, one challenge is simply to make solar cells and electrolyzers cheaper. Um, and solar cells are already becoming cheaper. Electrolyzers are, are still quite expensive. Um, one of the challenges there is um, around reducing the cost of the precious metals, um, either by reducing their loading or finding, their, or, or finding things that are cheaper than iridium and platinum to use as electrolyzers, as catalysts and as electrolyzers. Um, Another is around that um, the, 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 the electrolyzers which work well with intermittent light sources are called polymer um, PEM electrolyzers, um, and these are more expensive. The alternative is to um, find ways to, um, to think about whether we can design direct sunlight conversion systems, which would be cheaper. And um, there are some quite in, in, inspiring examples of this, but uh, it, we already know it's possible to have systems which can take sunlight and convert um, um, that into making splitting water and hydrogen and oxygen with a high efficiencies, um, but, but over 15%. But these typically are, are expensive or not stable. Um, 
some of the systems which look like they could be both durable and stable, uh, durable and cheap, are based upon photocatalysts, on the idea you can have a particle, um, a, a light absorber, typically a, a, an inorganic semiconductor, um, a metal oxide most often, and you put catalysts on it and you shine light on it. And um, these you can either have in suspension or you can screen print them onto to substrates. Um, and can, they're already, their demonstration efficiency is around about 1%, which isn't enough. Um, but they are very cheap. And if we can understand how to separate the charges better in those materials, and the, and the main issue there is that um, most of the charges don't separate to drive the catalysis, they recombine. And we have to understand why they recombine and how to stop it. Um, and if we could do that, then we could imagine very simple systems which were um, where you're either in suspension or just as a, a sheet of, of particles stuck onto a, a piece of glass or a piece of plastic. Um, you, you shine light on it and off bubbles hydrogen oxygen. Uh, and um, that I think would be quite transformative if we can get it to work. But the Japanese particularly are doing a lot of work on this and we're now doing a lot of spectroscopy on the materials that the Japanese are developing. Thank you for the answer, sir. Also, uh, Professor, uh, by the year 2050, yeah, do you think that all the developed countries uh, will become carbon free? Are we there yet? So, of course, that's a question which is probably more politics than science. Um, and it, that depends upon political will. And it depends who, or who our global leaders are and how driven they are. <coughs> I, I can't predict what politics are going to be. Um, I think, I, but certainly from a scientific viewpoint, it's becoming increasingly possible. Um, and I think we are going to see increasing use of both solar and wind, particularly um, as renewable power sources globally. Um, and so I, I, it's pathways to decarbonize the electrical power generation seem to me to be clear. Um, pathways to decarbonizing transport and industry and heating and air conditioning is uh, in some ways more challenging. And clearly batteries is one part of that story. I personally think that finding pathways to store renewable power as chemical bonds and chemical bonds as a molecular fuel or, or a chemical will be likely to be a key element of how we can fully decarbonize our energy systems. Um, there's um, many transport applications where it's hard to imagine batteries working in planes and in ships and probably going to need a fuel in both those cases and to me it's important that that fuel is fossil fuel free um, and carbon neutral. Um, we need to store large amounts of energy to cope with the intermittency of renewables uh, and batteries are very good for short-term storage but not good for long-term storage because they don't scale but if you can if you can synthesize a fuel then the scaling is just to build a, build a bigger tank to hold the fuel in and that's much, much easier to scale. Um, you could also imagine that, the, or, or you have a challenge that the um, regions of the world with high energy demand are not necessarily the regions of the world with high renewable power generation. And we're going to need to find ways to move renewable power around the world. And you could do that by um, electric cables, but we're starting to understand that's expensive and the energy difference is not so high. Um, Storing the renewable energy in a fuel you put in a tanker um, would allow us to use the existing infrastructure, um, allow us to transport very large amounts of what would be fundamentally a, a sustainable, sustainable energy around the world. Um, and I think those would be key enablers, which are areas where the science is probably not yet um, well established, which is why I'm so interested in working in this area artificial photosynthesis. And uh, Professor, 
you have mentioned in your profile that your area of research is interdisciplinary and as a student who is studying computational chemistry i would like to ask you the role of computational techniques such as molecular dynamics and machine learning in modern science field so one of the things i've loved about my own experience of research is how interdisciplinary it is um i i i've now worked in the chemistry department for 20 years <clears throat> but before that um i i'd worked in the, the i've studied in physics in biology and in biochemistry departments um i now have a part time position in, in my position in swansea is in the faculty of engineering um in 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 the material science department there and so um my own experience of science is highly disciplinary my own research group is highly disciplinary um and so i have engineers and physicists and chemists sometimes i have a, um, a, a biochemist that's not at present um i must admit i'm not very good at theory and so i don't have any real um computational scientists in my group um but we work a lot with them and um of course the power of computational science molecular dynamics and and, and i i i've been stunned by some of the work that some of my colleagues have been doing on machine learning to help us understand the trends we see in materials um it, it's it's stunning um the, a lot of the challenge we've had is that um as we try to synthesize materials um over lot of using low cost and typically low temperature processing routes um so we're very interested in trying to be able to, to paint or or coat um solar cells or photocatalysts onto a surface then you end up with materials which are disordered and um a lot of our research is trying to understand the impact of disorder upon function and disorder is harder to calculate um you can use monte carlo simulations to try and get some sense of disorder but um it, if you ask a, a um a, 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 a theoretician to calculate the electronic structure of a new material they'll go off and put it into a, a calculate structure um the atomic structure and then go on and try and calculate the electronic structure and they'll come back to you with some wonderful structure but that often has rather little relationship to really what we observe in the material in practice because of this disorder um and so it it would it would seem to me that um of, of course we already are doing many collaborations around understanding it using molecular dynamics and machine learning and many other software approaches uh, calculation approaches to um help us understand our experimental data um i i suspect some of some of the advances we really going to need to understand is um understanding the impact of disorder and imperfect materials and 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 how we can think about those for example in catalysis people often talk about the idea that um, catalysis happens at defect sites on surfaces um i'm personally not sure i believe that with materials we study but um that calculations on such defects in disorder are often much harder to make quantitative and predictive but, but certainly i think there's a huge opportunity for theoreticians to work with functional experimentalists to help develop the, the next materials and, our, and to understand why one material works better than another and uh, that's a very interesting professor and professor whom do you consider as your inspiration and why uh, i was wondering about that of course there's many different levels of inspiration um and my family and my children and my, my ex-wife and my, my current partner all inspirations um to me um scientifically but 
there were a number of, of inspiring scientists um, in my undergraduate studies, and in particular there was a, um, an engineer, um, Toby Cumberbatch, who got inspired about painting solar cells onto, onto um, to, to, um, buildings in, in developing countries to the by power to power to all. Um, it, it was probably not very realistic, but it certainly got me excited at the time. Um, I think my really my scientific inspiration more than anyone would have been my two PhD supervisors, and particularly um, George Porter, um, who, who um, inspired me in the scientific process, I would say. Uh, and um, the, the curiosity driven science and trying to understand things, and, and, and also about how to inspire and lead people. And, um, to not be too directive. He largely left me to my own devices and when I had a good idea, I'd go and see him and he'd go, oh, well done James or something and give me some feedback. Um, but having that intellectual freedom to find my own path well, was very inspirational. Professor, for the next few questions, we would like to ask some advice from you. Uh, regarding oh. uh, the different aspects of having a career in science. Uh, so oh, yes. So moving on, uh, the first question is about research. So most of the students, they think like uh, doing a research is like the tough part. However, we have to publish it, uh, like not only to get it across the scientific community, but also the general public. But there are certain instances where the media kind of blows it out of proportion or the society misinterprets it. So in this context, what additional skills do you think a researcher should possess? So uh, everything, uh, what you said there is entirely true. And um, I, I, the only thing I'd add to what you just said is that even within a scientific community, publishing a paper is not sufficient. You need to, uh, um, particularly in areas which are controversial, I must say most of, a lot of what we do is quite controversial. Um, it, it, you need not just to publish a paper, but you need to go and talk to people and explain why you think what you think. And um, both in talks, but then probably often in the bar afterwards, um, that's rather harder now, um, to, to try to, to help people understand um, what it is you're trying to say, because of course, when you write a paper, um, that only has meaning if it has impact um, in terms of changing the field. Um, and indeed, um, I, I've had plenty of experience of media getting carried away. Well, not plenty, but some. But one of the most uh, sort of media-friendly papers we published was on solar cells, which responded to acoustic waves. Um, they enhanced performance when in terms of sound. And, we published a paper on it and then we, we did a press release and talked about um, which sort of music that the solar cells preferred. Um, and and um, it turned out the solar cells preferred pop music um, because the pop music has more high frequency in it for the synthesizer. Um, but we didn't, the, the, the student who played it, who did the study, used Adele in her, in her, in her when she was playing to the, to the, to the um, solar cells and the, the solar cells like Adele. Um, but we didn't think we should say who we played because that might upset people or, or I don't know what. Um, and so we didn't say what, what music it was. And unfortunately, number one at the time was um, uh, Ma not Miley Cyrus, it, uh, it, 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 um, uh, Miley Cyrus on um, the wrecking ball where she was sitting on this um, big ball uh, with no clothes on, banging around. Um, and the press got very excited that, that um, uh, with the connection between Miley Cyrus and the wrecking ball and the solar cells. And so there's all these reports about how Miley Cyrus is going to save the world with, uh, with their music. Um, uh, and, and we had no control because it had gone out of our hands and that was just a story which, which took off. Um, in terms of really answering your question, then of, of course, under, as a researcher, you need to have skills of communication, but you also have to understand that you work as part of a team. And not everyone in that team has to have every skill. Um, and that's the whole point of teams. Um, and so in my own group, there are some people who love outreach and 
um, of all the, uh, um, whenever possible, organizing activities with um, school kids and, and, and demonstrations and things. And there are some who are very shy and have no desire at all to do that. Um, and have other skills. And um, as, as a researcher, of course, you need to have some skills um, beyond just research. You also need to have people skills and about people management and all this. There are many skills you need as a researcher. Um, but you don't have to do everything. And you do have to understand where your strengths are as a person and where your weaknesses are and make sure that when you are in the environment you end up working in, you can work alongside people who complement your skills. Because you can't do everything. I mean, not all perfect. Thank you for that, Professor. And another important problem that most of the young students who are pursuing science face is the fact is that it's multifaceted. So what made you choose photochemistry? And what advice would you give uh, to the young students who are pursuing science uh, when coming to choose a certain area in the field? I didn't really choose photochemistry. I, I found it. Um, when, when my PhD student starts, I always tell them it's very important we have a plan. And this is your plan for your PhD, and you've got an idea of how we're going to get started and what we're going to head towards. And then I always say it's very important to recognize the plan will probably change. And it's very unlikely you'll end your PhD doing what you thought you were going to do when you started. Um, because a plan gives you inspiration and direction. But if you don't keep your eyes open and, and, and are aware of opportunities, which and the unexpected is often the unexpected result or opportunity which comes along, which is the big breakthrough. And if you, if you don't keep your eyes open to that, then you miss so much. And, and for me, I wanted to work in solar energy. Um, but unfortunately, I chose to want to work in solar energy um, in, in the 80s when there was, um, I still wanted to work on solar cells and, uh, for a PhD after my degree. Um, but I, I went around the UK trying to find a PhD on solar cells and there was really nothing very exciting because um, the oil price had crashed and all the money for photovoltaic research had disappeared and I couldn't find anything exciting. Um, and then my, my project supervisor in Cambridge told me to contact George Porter and, uh, and go to see him. And I, I actually, I didn't really know what he did or who he was. Um, when I went to see him. Um, but he, but he, he got me excited about plant photosynthesis and said, ah, oh, yes, you've got to tell you plant photosynthesis, I need you to build lasers, and that's very good. Um, and he is a photochemist. I mean, I've never really heard of photochemistry before. Um, but it, I could see it was relevant to solar energy, and it was exciting. Um, and so that's where I cut my teeth, and that's how I got excited by photochemistry. It was only after the interview in, when I discovered he had a Nobel Prize. I didn't I had no idea at the time. Um, because in those days you couldn't look things up online. Um, but that got me inspired. Um, and I found my niche and what, I'm sure I could have found other niches. I could have been something else apart from a photochemist. But once I'd gained some expertise and I could see I could be useful and had a, a, a contribution to play um, in the development of um, solar energy, materials of solar energy, I, I stuck with it. And now I enjoy it. I'm sure I could have been something else, but I, it, it's the opportunity I found and the pathway I found and I've managed to, to make my niche. And uh, Professor, something I have noticed in myself as well as in my peers is that we are afraid of setbacks and failures. As a scientist who is a recipient of many prestigious awards and titles, have you faced any setbacks in your career? And if so, how did you overcome them? And do you have any advice for all the youngsters who are afraid to take a step forward due to the fear of failure? Well, there's never one pathway. And um, if one thing doesn't succeed, then you have to find another pathway. So I, and I didn't follow a conventional pathway because of course the, the normal plan is that after you do your PhD, you, you travel the world and, and do many and have postdocs all over the place and uh, have much excitement. Um, I, I couldn't do that because um, I, I became a father at an early age and my, my, my wife was not keen to travel anywhere or not. She allowed me to travel to Holland. Um, that's, that's the furthest we were allowed to go um, for a year. And then I had to come back to the UK. 
um, and I went back to Imperial, so I've been at Imperial all my life, pretty much, um, which is a wonderful place to be, but it's not what you'd recommend, um, and, and not what I recommend to people I talk to. Um, I, I almost um, quit academia, of course, there, there's a, um, a, a big challenge for anyone wanting to be an academic, trying to go from being the postdoc to be, having the permanent post, or, or the, or the long-term post, or, and, um, I, I have children and responsibilities, and I, 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 um, was, I ended up applying for a five-year fellowship, and I knew that if I didn't get that five-year fellowship that year, I would quit and um, move to industry. Um, but luckily, I, did, I, did, I was awarded it and was able to move on. You have to believe in yourself. Um, you also have to recognize that there is some element of chance to life and things you can't predict. And if you are too fixed in one pathway and you fell at that pathway and that's the end of your life and disaster, that's not a good attitude. You, know, you, you have to be responsive and flexible to whatever life throws at you. Um, and sometimes it's good and sometimes it's hard. I think, and I think that's true in life and true, true in a career. Um, but you do need to try and aim high. Uh, uh, you also have to aim realistically. You have to recognize where you are and who you are um, and how much you can achieve will depend upon what facilities you have available and what, what, and what, what money there may be available to support your work. Um, so, but at the same time, you should aim to do the best you can with what you have. And it doesn't work, I do something else for the main goal work. And of course, in research, it happens all the time. But um, we, uh, all, uh, all of our research has, um, uh, of course, in papers, we talk about what succeeds, but we then not talk so much about all the experiments that didn't work. But certainly, in my own lab, most experiments we do um, and do not end up in papers because we don't understand the results or something went wrong or a sample died or whatever it may be. And that's the nature of research. And, and you have to get used to that and move on and, and look at the positives and try and not look at the negatives. Does that help? Yes, Professor. And thank you for those inspiring words. That's fine. It truly was an honor to have been able to interview you, Professor. And, and I hope that was useful. I've, I've no idea, really. Um, what are your own plans for your careers? So, uh, I'm planning to uh, migrate to USA or some other country to do my PhD. And in, in what area? In computational chemistry. I see. Okay. I'm hoping to do the same, I guess. I'm not sure yet, but then for now, that is the plan. Right? Most probably okay. in genetics or neuroscience, something like that. Make sure that alongside the science, you can see a pathway which you would, you enjoy the process as well as the end. In, in, the, in the sense that, um, don't, I, I've always felt that it's very important that I, I focus on what I want to achieve, but also I have to make sure that I find a pathway which I can actually enjoy and feel rewarded and feel I can grow. Sure. So, yeah. Those are very inspiring words, Professor. Okay, um, very good. It's very nice to meet you both. Yeah, thank you so much, Professor, for taking your time off your busy schedule for us. That's really fine, that's a pleasure. Lot. Okay, um, very good. Good luck. We wish you all the very best in your future indoors, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. And to wrap things up, we interview Professor James Curran from Imperial College London. And that's it from us today. Thank you for joining with us and stay tuned in for more. Thank you. Thank you.